So good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, I try to say it. Uh, I try to say it with the help of my friends here. So Sion, Vasdenia, Vasdenia, uh, Zapausia, Politecnica. That's my. That's the. That's the conclusion of my Russian. But congratulations for 120 years. It's a big celebration. Uh, I'm thinking it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for waking up in the morning. Uh, I'm sure it's a little bit colder where you are than in Israel. So uh, we still have the, we are still have the sun here, but uh, thank you for joining. And today I will talk about the speech processing for intelligent systems. I just, I'm wondering who are the people that uh, are with me in the session. So I know it's not many, but I would be, we are like 21 people. I would like to know if there are students, so you can raise your hands. Who, who is a student uh, here among you? Uh, a lot of students. Yeah, the Malam. Yeah, okay. Do you have a lot of students here? Okay, so we have a... Uh, can, can someone open the mic? Tell me who he is, uh, who is participating. Is, uh, is, are you professors uh, from other countries? Only if you want. Okay, so I will start by telling you about myself. Uh, so I have a PhD in computational linguistics. I studied in the States, in New York. And um, I uh, was one of the first computational linguists started to, uh, from the, um, finished my PhD mid 90s and I went back to Israel. I worked in research and development in speech uh, processing in Bell Labs, uh, in IBM and other institutions. And I was in industry for many, many years, building speech platforms, uh, doing voice user interface, NLP, multimodality. Um, I had a lot of experience in industry and then I, uh, eight years ago, joined the academia and really wanted to give back to uh, the young students that uh, are going out into the industry from my experience. Uh, I'm also doing something which is, uh, I, I, I'm very interested in multimodal interfaces, uh, which I will elabor elaborate and I wrote a book uh, a few years ago and a new book is coming out uh, next year as well. Um, I am here on a, on uh, my academic uh, work has uh, two roles, and I just wanted to introduce to you what is it that I do when I don't do speech. So uh, I'm the head of a department called Multidisciplinary Studies, uh, which is something very unique uh, that we have in the university. There is nothing like this in Israel and very few in the world. Uh, actually, we are a department that unites all the other faculties that we have here in HIT. We have design, sciences, engineering, uh, um, uh, digital medical technologies, instructional technologies, and industrial uh, 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 engineering. And, and my department, which I'm heading, is actually giving everyone a chance to work together in teams and uh, to uh, experience industry projects, cooperation, innovation, and entrepreneurship uh, sessions and workshops, and to deal with applied research while you're doing it together with other students from different faculties, which is the first time they actually meet design with engineering, software with industrial management, and so forth. So it's really unique, and we have a lot of international activities, and we have agreements with many universities who come, who send their students via Zoom, or actually when we could come here to take part in the, these very wonderful courses that we give. Uh, and uh, they are uh, divided into four clusters, uh, humanities, social science, integrated technologies, uh, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and also community engaged uh, courses. All are multidisciplinary and with the target of creating this new language of working together, which is so important now in the industry. When people go out, they don't stay in their own silos anymore. This is why next week, today is your celebration, Monday is our celebration. We have a, a, a conference and I invite you to register. Uh, I know Galina uh, sent to everyone the link. Uh, it's called the Multidisciplinary Green 2020. It's a conference, wonderful conference where researchers 
academic researchers come and share their journey from one um, discipline to another and share their story of how they took different, uh, different areas and put them together. So I invite you to register and to enjoy. So going back to our, uh, our topic of today, after you know a little bit about me, and I want to talk about speech processing for intelligence system, the one thing I want to say that, is, that this is a very, very multidisciplinary area. It's not enough to be a linguist, it's not enough to be a computer scientist, and it's not enough to be someone who's doing design. It's all together uh, because... Uh, this is a challenge of conversational interaction. It's not just to create a system that you can that can understand you, but it's something that is much more than that. You want a flow, you want a dialogue, you want an interaction that makes you feel good. So when we talk about this, we say, what is the motivation? What is the motivation of doing that? And what we see is that the assumption is that relationship with technology in general and machine interaction specifically are based on the same elements which human to human interaction is based. So even though we know that we are speaking to a machine, we still want to feel the same feeling as if we are speaking to a different or another person. So yes, we are forgiven. Forgiveful. We know that the machine can sometimes not understand us like humans. We know that sometimes we have a difficulty in expressing ourselves, but still we want to get the feeling that we are not estranged. And this is very important. Understand me and my needs. Be a little bit empathic. Build trust. We need to build trust even though we, what we are talking to a machine because we want to feel that when we take Google Maps, it will bring us to the right place and not to a different place. And if I'm giving information for my bank, still I'm giving the right information and not something which is uh, misleading. And it needs to be a structural dialogue because even when we talk to a machine, when we talk to people, we have the structure. And if people deviate from the structure, we think they're weird. So even with the machine, we want a structured dialogue. And we want something we prefer if it can be a little bit personalized, something that meets me, okay? I want to feel a little bit. I'll give you examples later of projects that we did to answer all these emotion or all these requirements that we think are crucial for the dialogue. One of the things that uh, we talk about, and now in Corona time, in COVID-19 time, it's even more and more emphasized is that we talk about social isolation. We talk about loneliness. People are in their houses. They don't go much. They don't meet others. They, uh, I, I don't know how it is uh, in Ukraine, but in Israel, uh, for many weeks, we couldn't see our family. We couldn't interact with our friends. Work was different. We worked from home. We teach in Zoom. You know that. And, uh, and I'm sure we are experiencing very similar emotions. But uh, lack of social interaction, is, uh, if, if it's for everyone, then for the elderly, it's much more crucial because they are in danger more than the young people and we keep them safe, but by keeping them safe, we also keep them away. I want to show you a, 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 little, a little movie, okay, about an application of an animal avatar. See for yourself. Can you help scratch my itch? I got you scratching now. How is it feeling? That's good. How's that feel? Oh, you're so good. You're the best scratcher ever. Oh, you're only saying that. I love you too, Jimmy. I love you too, buddy. The kitty is so beautiful. You make me so happy. Okay, so what we see here is something that touches almost everyone in the sense that we see this person who needs companionship, who needs to, 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 uh, to be uh, in contact. And this application is real. It's called Jerry Joy. It's, it's a product. And you see it and you say, okay, it's just a cartoon. It's just a little avatar. It understands and knows how to interact. And the effect is really important. Why? Because this is a story about human-machine relations. Okay? We have, uh, we have the 
personal assistant at home. We have Alexa and Google Home and uh, HomePod, and and we are interacting uh, a lot with them with everything that we need in the house. We also have Alexa now in the car and, and, and Google Assistant, which we are also creating a relationship when we drive, when we need information, when we need to call somebody and so forth. We also have now the very smart refrigerators from Samsung and LG that are becoming a family hub with all the information that we interacting with. So this is also a new path with the smart home and everything. And the picture that you see with the two children is very interesting. It's a robot that was designed for a children on the autistic spectrum, which uh, who did not want to speak to humans because they were afraid. But when they spoke to the robot, it was easier for them to interact and afterwards to get the treatment. So this is this kind of uh, thinking can help us to go out of the box to places where we can really make use of these technologies if the interaction is designed correctly. So what is the challenge? Why is that a challenge? First of all, speech is undergone a change. We see that. It's, it's almost the new touch today. It's in, integrally embedded in every mobile application that we have. And the, when we have more and more interaction with end users through personal assistant, through wearables, through avatars, if in games and so forth, and we see a lot of a collection of data, big data for speech through the major companies that hold the data. You can say it's good or bad, but in any case, this data exists and this data can be used, hopefully for good things, but also to improve the engines. And, the, and, and really, what is, when we process speech, what is it all about? What is the information that we have in speech, in audio files? First of all, we are interested to know what is being said. What is actually being said? Uh, what is it that I'm asking for? But then even more important is what is the user intention? Because I can say that, uh, I can ask the question, you know what the most popular question in Siri is? Where is the, net, the nearby Chinese restaurant? Okay, when I'm asking this, what is it? I'm saying where is it's a question, but what am I really asking? I'm, and, and then Siri now answer this, the next, uh, uh, the next closest, uh, the, the closest to the Chinese restaurant is this and this. Would you like me to order a place for you? Which is really my intention. I'm not just asking because I want to know the map uh, description. I really want to order a place, so to reserve a place. So what is the user intention? Or when I'm upset and I'm calling the call center and I'm cursing, do I really need to understand the curses? No, I just need to understand that this person is in distress and I need to help him. So uh, the third question, who is speaking? Who is it that is speaking? Maybe I cannot uh, uh, deduce that, but sometimes I know who is the person who is speaking and then I can relate to him personally and create an environment and interaction that meets his needs and requirements. What about the emotions? The emotions that we have in the speech. We know that through acoustic features, we can really recognize what are the emotions, the st emotional state that the speaker is under. And we can deduce what is the next best offer that we can give him according to this emotional state. And what do we know about the context environment? Is it noisy? What time of day? What are, we can do that through sensors, through other uh, clues. Like all of this data, the, with addition of the metadata of the interaction, is giving us a variety, a full world of information that is embedded in the speech. This is why it is so important. Because today, everything is about the experience. Everything is about the experience. And so the acoustic data, the biometric data, the lexical and grammatical information, the emotional and the context collected together give us a multiple platform that we can use. And where can we see this platform used in engines? Engines like speech recognition and speech synthesis and speech biometrics and emotional detection and all that. So we we are actually using these engines underneath the applications. If we go back to the timeline 
of of uh, of, uh, of speech history. We see that there we started in the 70s with creating for moving from analog to di digital, and then because of the DARPA project for the United States Defense Office, a lot of money was invested in databases. I was part of this project uh, when I was studying uh, for my PhD in 2000, where we had uh, where we had um, the um, uh, uh, voice search beginning with Google coming in a social social uh, uh, social uh, network. There was also a change, and of course, 9/11 was a major major boost to speech technology because of uh, the discoveries that a lot of things were spoken and if detected could be avoided. Apple Siri was a great game changer because it put speech in everybody's pocket. So I didn't have to go to purchase something to speak to a machine. It was already embedded in my uh, phone. Alexa brought it from the personal to the family. So that was another game changer. And Google Duplex, I don't have time to show you the video, but look it after. Google Duplex coming out in 2018 actually was designed here in Arcelia in Israel by researchers for Google that enabled to do an interaction which looks complete, which sounds completely natural without even a clue that this is a machine. And of course, COVID-19 with the approach of speak, don't touch that, that brought us so many changes in our life in addition to just be able to do everything digital using speech. So this is the game changers. I, I, I see time is flying. So I will continue. Infrastructure, where do we find speech? Internet of things, smart home, bots, wearables, IVR telephone system, home personal assistant, in our TVs, smart TVs, application, in the car, in the automotive industry, investing huge, huge amounts of, of money in order to improve the speech in the car. And of course, social robots, that is a technology and an industry that is uh, as coming and changing and becoming something very uh, a part of our life. Um, when we talk about the data and the usage of social network, voice search uh, uh, engines and conversation engines, we see a lot of platforms that can be used for that. And of course, in use cases, we, we talk about sales and infotainment, companionship that we mentioned, social interactive, a personal assistant and identification for biometrics. So there's a lot of use cases for that. The interaction in the digital era has changed a lot. It changed because the market changed and we are experiencing this as we speak today. The user expectations and the user experience is now the thing that we all talk about. There's not much difference in the functionality. There's no much difference in the, um, in the prices. There is a lot of difference in the experience. So everybody's talking about intelligent, conversational, interactive, uh, access through channel, ubiquity. Okay, so we are now looking at how it will be done. We already know it can be done. We know we can improve the engines, but it's, it's not too much improvement. We need to improve the experience. It should be no-brainer, intuitive, rapid, and intelligent. This, this is what the customer experience should look like. We talk more and more now about self-service, touchless, on the go, as you do things, you want to speak as you do things. So the application is helping you to free your hands anywhere, always, and to create a customer service. I'm moving along because I want to show you some examples of projects that we did. Um, I will skip this slide with your permission. This is just an example of, uh, of mistakes because we talk about the challenge of mistake of uh, Alexa, okay? One of my supervisors, kids, was telling her a joke in front of Alexa and out of nowhere, Alexa said, that's a funny joke. So these things that are listening to us all the time, we need to see how we merge them into our life. And there are more examples. Alexa, I don't want two shoes added to my shopping list. I want tissues. Okay, it's about ambiguity. How is ambiguity being resolved when we talk about that? And someone who ordered a book called McDonald's got, uh, wanted a meal by McDonald's, got a book by McDonald's. So there is still to go and the challenge is still there. 
Um, when we talk about the evolution, we talk the, all about the move from computing to cognitive computing to creative and productive computing and to effective computing. So we are talking about this change from just a machine that knows to do very good calculation and very smart operation into something that is actually intelligent, predictive, creative, and also effective. And this is a huge development, a huge evolution. I believe that we are still not there, but, but at least we have something to aspire for. I want Welcome. to tell you... What would you like to book? So I will start this, and please listen very carefully to how smart we can be. Welcome. What would you like to book? Hi, I would like to book three hotel rooms uh, to Adelaide. We're going to be three adults, two children, and one baby. And I'm going to need it uh, for the 10th of December until the 18th. Okay. Your booking information has been accepted. What? Thank you for choosing our service. What have we seen here? What we saw is that a person spoke freely, made a reservation in one sentence. The system understood everything and put it into the form of ordering a vacation. Uh, it knew how to translate me and my wife into uh, uh, the adults or children, uh, uh, babies and so forth. And uh, from when next week, when it's going to be next, what is next week and so forth. So there, uh, 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 the ability to understand free speech is very important to create a customer experience, which is natural. But this is a real system that is working, and it's very, very smart. So when we talk about uh, natural language processing, we ask the question of what kind of virtual agent classification we see. We see a lot of words used for service, board, check, board, virtual assistant, personality, conversational agent, virtual agent, avatar, and humanoid. But what is really the difference between them? And I claim, this is my personal claim, they differ in the qualities, whether they are just visual or they are voice enabled, is it just text enabled? Is there a machine learning based dialogue or just a simple interaction? Do I have personalization options or it's really natural and natural and, and, and there's no person personalization? Is this my avatar that is going to play the games for me? or it's third-party agent. Is it effective? Is it multimodal? So it's the qualities of the of these agents that determine what type they will be. But this is my unique analysis that uh, from my experience, uh, see if we look at what's going on now, that the robots that are being used, uh, uh, when we talk about not being closed or exposed to our patient, so instead of wearing all these clothes that the doctor is able to to speak and to interact with the patient on the uh, on the other side, and I think I don't know which one you choose, but there are at least more options. Um, but where do we take it? And, and the question of ethics, although this is not a lecture about ethics, but the ethics plays a role because look at this uh, this um, very bad example that a patient was informed that he has a dying disease, something he's going to die for. And the family learned it from the hospital robot. So there is a question, what is the limit that I go? If I want to tell someone that he has a very difficult disease, maybe I need to think about empathy. And maybe there are some things that I don't want to use the machine for. So there, there are a lot of ethical questions, and this is a separate, uh, um, a separate lecture that I would be happy to come for the 125-year celebration but still a, a something to talk about amongst yourself. Um, I'm, I want to conclude by showing you a project we did here in LJT. I did with my, um, uh, with my students and we published. We actually built the first pregnant avatar women, woman. We called, her, we called her Hera. And this is she, as we designed it, for pregnant women during their pregnancy uh, to be to get assisted, assist, assistance, to get information, to get emotional support, and to connect to social media. We built the whole project. It's working. It's an avatar. There was no avatar, net pregnant avatar in the world before. So we were the first one to do that. And we really built the whole system. 
uh, uh, go, starting with the image, designing the image. There were no images of pregnant women. Uh, so it was really weird and to do that, but really we tried to do that. And then we did a lot of focus groups with pregnant women to understand what is it that they want, what is it, what is it that they expect for their avatar in order to create the right functionality. We uh, worked uh, very hard to do lip syncing between what is being said and the avatar so it doesn't sound weird. And that was a challenge for all the speech and interaction. And uh, I can maybe show you how it sounds like. Um, maybe you will help me to press the first one. No, go up. Just touch, touch the... Would you like a reminder? Okay, but go for the first one. Yeah. Here is what I found. Okay. I know the feeling. It may it's be really a good idea to not talk with your best friend. Okay, so this didn't come out well. But in any case, we had to choose the voice. It's text to speech. We chose a soft voice that that meets the that met the requirement of the lady that we interviewed and what they wanted to uh, to choose. And we even got we give gave them four images to choose from, and they chose the right one with the with the I think it's your left with the white thread. Their only remark was, "Take her off the hill. No pregnant woman goes with the hill." So that's what we did, and she was barefoot. We called her Hera, and we implemented this project all the way. Um, to just looking at my time, uh, to show you another another way of interaction. Interesting. This was a competition that I judged in for avatars, and this was Cassandra who won first prize. Although she doesn't look something else, but she speaks very nicely. Let's hear her. Um, one second. Yeah, I need to press. Yeah. Can you help me with my Shakespeare research? I'll certainly try. So when was Hamlet written? There is not a simple answer. Sources disagree, but consensus is that it was written between 1599 and 1601. Was it based on a real person? Scholars think that it is probably based on the Scandinavian legend of Amleth. Okay, so there, there is a real conversation going on. She's nice to look at, she's nice to listen to. Uh, it's a little bit high volume, so you can hear, but it's really interesting. And she is, this is not a new project, but it's a very interesting project and a very uh, uh, interesting choice of the audience. So, to conclude, my research and, and the area research, okay? So we're talking about effective interaction and multimodal architecture. We didn't talk about it much for the next time. Personalization, how to increase trust and to have a very strong dialogue, dialogue manager that manages all this interaction in a very smart, intelligent way, which creates the customer experience for the customers to cooperate with the machine. And this is the story of human and machine interaction via speech. I thank you very much, and I will accept questions if you have.